Okay, you are a second offender. Decent behavior with the juvenile, January 6, 2014. You served 25 years the Louisiana Department of Correction, 11 years suspended upon release of five years supervised probation. Your parole date is December 13th, 2019, with a good time, not eligible, full term date of December 13th, 2026. Today, your case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. On the panel today is Ms. Cheryl Renatsas. And myself, Jim Wise, I'll be chairing today. At this time, your case will be turned over to Mr. Roche. Mr. Roche? Thank you, Mr. Wise. Good morning, Mr. Mouton. How are you? Nervous, but good. Okay. Sit back and relax. <laughs> and this is going to be a conversation between you and the panel. And we're going to ask you some questions. And uh, according to your responses in the um, input we get from the staff at Allen, and we'll make a decision, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mouton, you're 29 years old. Yes, sir. And you've served eight years of a 14-year sentence. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And this is your second felony conviction? Yes, sir. And I see your first felony conviction was dealing with firearms, illegal possession and legal carry of firearms. Tell us why you carry a firearm. I, I bought it just to just to have it. I don't I made an ignorant decision. That's really it. I thought it was cool to have one. I just wish I wouldn't have. It was cool, right? No, it wasn't. Not now. And then four months later, you got arrested for three counts of simple burglary, which was a felony, a criminal damage to property. Tell me about that. I was, somebody came over and I went walking with them and there was three abandoned trailers on the side of the road and he he wanted to go in them and I went with him. I made the decision to go with him. And we took copper wiring out of the, the mobile homes. Oh, so that was in 11, nine years ago. And uh, you were 20 years old. You were old enough to make a good decision, but you didn't. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and then in 2012, you had four counts of aggravated rape two counts of sexual battery, and you pleaded, you pleaded to um, indecent behavior. You got a pretty good deal, like, don't you think? Yes, sir. And you agreed to serve 14 years. Actually, you got 25 years, and 11 of those years was suspended. You got a super good deal. Yes, sir. So why should we release you uh, early from your 14-year uh, sentence? Um, I'm 29 years old right now. Like, as y'all know, I mean, I made bad decisions in the past. I can, I can own up to that. Um, I can't take it back. All, all I can do is move forward. And I hope y'all can... Y'all look at my file and what I say today and give me a chance to prove to y'all that I really am have changed and I am changed and I'm not the same person that I was eight years ago. I have a 12 year old daughter out there that I, I wanna be out there with her and not away from her in here. Uh, I've seen her two times since I've been down and that's my main focus. And what really keeps me going is my daughter. And okay, Mr. Muto, yes, you were given ample chance in, in February 2012. Uh, you pleaded to possession of a stolen firearm and the other firearm charges, and you were given probation. That was in February. In December of the same year, you were arrested again and due to term of your supervision. And Pretty much the judge 
uh, sent you back to jail and your supervision expired while you were incarcerated. Yeah, Am yes, I right? Sir. Yes, sir. So you didn't do very well on supervision the first time. So why, you know, no. tell, me, tell me what's different this time. You had a daughter in 2012. Yeah, yes, sir. And, and you say you, you realize that you have a daughter out there and you need to be with your daughter, but you had your daughter in 2012 and you did the exact opposite. Uh, let me, with the, with the probation when I was out there, which is no excuse. I'm not trying to give you an excuse at all. Um, I, I don't know if it, it doesn't say it, that y'all have it. The charge that I have came before I was on probation. When I was on probation, I don't know if y'all could talk to the probation officer or none. I, I met my meeting, I paid on time. I after I was on probation, I didn't mess up. This came before that I was on probation, sir. Um okay, okay. And this information I have in front of me is in, incorrect. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank I, you. I don't let, want to let, let me inform you that you have opposition from the judge in the judge said in the statement, I think it's too soon for early release. That was a judge that said to you in the 14th JDC. The Sheriff's Office, Mr. Gene Pittman, we are opposed to early release for this offender. This offender has only served a certain amount of years on a 25 year sentence. I think it's too early. Um, <laughs> Both the victim and the mother of the victim, they were contacted, but they refused to make any statement uh, for or opposed to your early release. Yes, sir. Um, Management, I didn't get there completed because the, the mental health. What, what phase of risk management are you in? I was about to take the third phase. So you you in the second phase? Yes, sir. Fourteen hours into it. Okay. Now, uh, tell me about your disciplinary record. I have four write-ups. Uh, when was your last write-up? My last write-up. You you said my. When was your last write-up, sir? A year and a half, I think, around okay. about. How long have you been at Allen? I think right at five years, six years. Okay. Uh, would the staff at Allen tell me exactly when his last write up was and what was that write up for? His last write up was in June of 2019 for a uh, number five aggravated disobedience. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Crystal, what, what was the one before that? The one before that was July 16th, 2018 for a 30K general prohibited behavior. Could you tell me about that one, uh, Crystal? I'll have to dig a little bit, Mr. Roche. To find okay, we'll come back to you later. Okay. Uh, tell me, do you have any vocational skills? Yes, sir. I've, uh, since I've been, I've been at prison industry for three years. I've been building furniture, and they had did a program of NCCER. I'm certified carpentry. Good. Uh, I've uh, certified hydro blaster, uh, level one plumbing. I'm also certified instructor. I can teach. Uh, I can teach carpentry and teaching. Uh, were you employed at the time of your incarceration? I was I was working on the railroad service for TGS out of Nederland, Texas. So, so you you were working for the railroad? Yes, sir. A good paying job. Yes, sir. 
Okay. Tell me about your transition plan. Sir? Tell me about your transition plan. Where do you plan to live? Where do you plan to work? Uh, I plan to live with my dad and my stepmom in Oakdale, Louisiana. <laughs> uh, my dad has a job lined up for me, moving mobile homes, making, excuse me, making a hundred dollars a day. I got, I have a friend that owns his, does his own work. He does carpentry work and all of that. He has stuff lined up. Um, I have a friend that works out of North Carolina, uh, rebuilding bridges. Uh, doing making twenty to twenty two dollars an hour, and I have a I feel like I have a good support system. So basically, you have things lined up. Plus, you have a lot of vocational skills, so you should have no problem finding a job. Yes, sir. Okay, are you a trustee? With my charge, I can't. I... Okay, okay, great, uh, Miss Simon. Yes, sir. Do you have any uh, remarks? Uh, is a warden present? Yes, sir. Warden Cooley is present now. Hey, warden. How you doing? Good morning. I'm all right. Good. Anything you'd like to say about Mr. Muto? No, sir. I don't have anything additional at this time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, warden. Ms. Simon, can you give me some information on that 30K? Yes, sir. I pulled it up. It looks like... Um, it was some inappropriate comments to a staff officer of, of officer here. Okay. Would you like me to read it into the record or? Um, I can see that very serious uh, write up. It has to do with a staff uh, member. Was it a female staff member? Yes, sir, it was. Thank you, ma'am. I, I don't think you have to read the, the actual, um, a narrative, I think I have a picture in my mind already. Uh, sir, before you get a picture, may sir, I? Sir, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ms. Simon, would you read the, the uh, write up, please? Yes, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. At the above date and time, I, Sergeant H. Wells, was filling up the patrol unit and was driving at maintenance. Offender Mouton Dustin. Number 594032 approached the driver. Dustin, number 594032 approached the driver window of the patrol unit and stated to me, Sergeant H. Wells, they snitched on you and I sent AJ to Mercury. I, Sergeant H. Wells, asked Offender Mouton. Dustin, what he was talking about, but couldn't get a direct answer from offender Mouton. Dustin Mouton is in direct violation of rule number 30K, general prohibited behavior. That was the 30K. Thank, th thank you, Ms. Simon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Please wait in the view. Okay, thank you very much. It's time, Ms. Renasa. <clears throat> Mr. Wise, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, I, I got one question. How many phases of the sex offender program have you completed? I've completed two, two and a half, two of them, sir. And there's you completed two of the uh, phases? Yes, sir, out of the four. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? I just hope y'all give me a chance to prove myself. Uh, okay. At this time, the board will be uh, voting. We'll be starting with Mr. Al, uh, Alvin Roche. Mr. Mouton, based upon an incomplete uh, sex offender treatment, for supervision history, opposition from the judge, opposition from law enforcement, and a general conduct that's unacceptable, my vote is to deny your request. 
Ms. Renatis? My vote, uh, Mr. Mouton, also is to deny for the reasons stated. At this time, I vote to deny because I, I want you to complete all four phases of sex offender treatment. And also you have strong opposition from law enforcement. Board decision day was to deny your parole. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that hearing took place in 2020 and we happen to have done his second, his follow-up hearing already, which took place June, 2023, three years later. It only has 3,000 views, so I think most of you haven't seen it. So what I'm going to do is play that hearing for you now. Uh, and he has his family here in attendance, and they get into a bit more of the details. Uh, we have Ms. Jackson here. So with that, let's jump in. Mr. Mouton, good morning. Would you introduce yes. yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number, please. Name is Dustin Mouton, DLC number 594032. All right. And um, Mr. Mouton, you've been through this process before, so you're familiar with it. So we'll just dive right into it. So for the record, sir, you're classified as a second, currently serving a 14-year sentence, uh, indecent behavior with a juvenile. Your parole eligibility was December 13, 2019. You do not earn good time. Your full term date is December 13, 2026. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Let me acknowledge you have some folks that are here in support today. Uh, you have your former employer, Mr. Rep Hanegraaff, brother Andrew Mouton, David Mouton Jr., another brother, another brother Nathaniel Mouton, and your stepmother, Ms. Dorothy Carmier, uh, Mr. Hanegraaff, Mr. Andrew, and Mr. David will be speaking on your behalf. Um, so you were seeing, uh, Mr. Mouton, your case was assigned to me, so I'm going to take the lead on the interview. You were seen in October of 2020, and you were denied. Now, do you remember uh, the reason you were given for the denial? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was denied because I didn't, I wasn't able to com complete the risk management program and the judge and something, it was something else. There was other opposition that was expressed. Yes, ma'am. And uh, how old are you, sir? 31, about to be, no, excuse me, 32, about to be 33. How much time have you served on this sentence? Ten and a half. Ten and a half years? Yes. And so since then, you um, have you completed the um, sex offender treatment? Yes, ma'am, and I'm, a I'm recently a facilitator in the treatment program right now. So that's like phase five? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So um, let me ask you about, you know, we also, there was law enforcement opposition last time. Of course, that is still there. That opposition is still present. And there's other opposition um, on behalf of the victim that, that's there. So it, let's speak about the victim. How old was the victim when this, you originally charged with four counts of aggravated rape. Yes, so yes. how old was the victim when all this started? It, she was 14, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a while. I think she was 14 and I was 19. There's some indication that she could have been younger than that, that it went on for a period of time. Excuse me? There's some indication in the record that she could have been younger than that. I think it was reported when she was age 14. So it happened obviously on more than one occasion. Yes, ma'am, it was multiple occasions. She, she used to come and sleep at the house and come to my job and visit all the time. She was a, I was a friend of the family. And that's what makes it so bad. Um, Started when she was about 10 years old. The confession I gave 
um, they put her at, I thought they put her at 12. I said, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm nervous. Please. I know. The confession I gave, I said I was 17 when it happened, thinking that would help me being underage at the time, not realizing the age that it put her at. And that's what I was convicted. I was convicted on my confession, the confession I gave. And what happened was that she was four, 13, 14 when it, the, the crimes with, that had, the crimes that happened. They happened at my house. She would come over, spend the night. And I don't, I don't want to seem like it's, it's her, it's my, it's, all oh, my fault. I'm, I should have been an adult. I, and I realized that and I truly am sorry. I wish I can talk to her and tell her that the things I've done in my past, that's that's not who I am. That's, I come along, I feel like I come a long way from 2012 when I was convicted to right now. And I just, like I said, I wish I can, if she was on, I would apologize. So, so let's talk about your treatment, your sex offender treatment, because that was specifically mentioned the last time you were seen by the parole board. What yes. did you learn about you in that class? What I've learned is you, sh you should never take advantage of no child under age or anything. You have to take responsibility of what you've done being a sex offender and don't put yourself or others in any position to even commit the crime or be around anything that's going on around them. being underage or even of age. It doesn't matter the age, really, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. So, uh, how long have you been a facilitator? Since November, December of last year. So about six months. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, so the last time I, we saw you, you had your last write up was in 2019. Have you had since then? No, ma'am, that is my last, last write-up. And since 2020, what has been, have you had any program opportunities? Have you taken advantage of uh, programs? Yes, ma'am, I've, uh, as y'all know, I've completed, like I said, I completed the risk management class. I've took, I went and took a surf safe class to learn about food, how to handle, to be safe with that. I've took a, we, it's called Life in Focus, which is, it touches every topic on drug usage because in my past I've done drugs and it touches bases on drugs, what it does to you, mindset, body, different classes on drugs. And I've, I'm enrolled right now in IC3, learning about computers, how to fill out applications, the was all uh, components of the com uh, computer. All um, that sent last hearing? Ma'am? All of that is since your last hearing in uh, October of 2020. Yes, yes ma'am. Well, you've been busy. I try, I try to. So have you been ever able to take victim awareness? No, ma'am. They have just thought. Ma'am? You ever asked to take that class? I didn't. I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. Have you ever asked to take that yes. class? Yes, ma'am. I've asked, I asked the chaplain who's over the class if he could put me in, but they have, he said they had already started, and I was, I'd asked him if I could get in and to get it. Even if I had to, after class is complete, go back and go and finish the classes that the part of the class that I missed. And he said he couldn't do it. 
uh, I asked the risk management, my risk management counselor to see if there was any way that she could have got me in it and she couldn't. All right. right. I, so let me ask you this. What is your expectation to get out of that class? Ma'am, to get in what the class? Is, no. What is your expectation? What do you expect to get out of that class? The risk management, uh, the victim, the awareness to, I don't know much about it, but what they were saying is more of to let you know that it's not just the victim, it's there's more, more to a victim is their family, my family, me, their surrounding families is, it's never, you're not just hurting one person, it's you're hurting everyone that's every loved one with so that's what you heard others talk about so have you given any thought on the impact your crime has had on that minor victim yes yes i have i thought about that a lot yes i, I really have here are some of your thoughts i've thought about how i took advantage of a young child and i wish like i said i wish i can tell her i'm sorry and uh I can take it back, and I, um, I just wish I would that I wouldn't. This part of my life wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't uh, happen. But it happened. You mentioned, mentioned earlier. You mentioned earlier about substance abuse. Have you taken any substance abuse classes? Yes, ma'am. I've took uh, Living in Balance, Phase One and Two. Like I mentioned, uh, Life in Focus. I've took. Phase one, two, and three of that that class. And life and focus is a substance abuse education program. It's the alcohol chemical class. Yes, ma'am. What the, are your the, um, future plans, uh, Mr. Mouton? Should you be released earlier, where would you go? I would go live with my stepmom and my dad in oakdale they have some property out there i have I have multiple jobs lined up uh as you'll see my brother nathaniel uh he's called a couple people he's worked for and lined me up with some jobs i had my stepmom call the probation officer to to get all my registration to, so we know where we stand with registration Filling yeah, cord. you have some significant challenges because of your crime. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am, and I understand that, and my family understands that, and they're willing to help me, and I'm grateful for that, that I have a good support system. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. I don't have any other questions. We'd like to hear from Warden Thompson. Is there anything to add? Yes, ma'am. Um, I can honestly say he's been trying. He's uh, we had him working on the trustee program a little while back. Where he's doing a lot of work for the facility. That facility grounds looking very good. Uh, he's completed a lot of classes uh, as far as the sex offender classes and all. I just uh, suggest my opinion. He just needs to continue enrolling in, in much classes as needed, all possible. Matter of fact, I have Miss Holmeson right now going check on and see. When, we, when it all possible, you probably be able to get into that victim awareness class that you were just speaking upon. Okay, good, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, well, um, let's hear from the folks who want to speak on your behalf. <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Hanover, could we hear from you, please, sir? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I am listed as a former employer. I'm far more than a former employer. I've been in contact with Dustin anywhere from two to 10 times a month for the duration of time he's been in. Uh, I've seen everything that he's done uh, it, down to the quality of work that he does on his belts and the furniture and everything that he's made and learned, all the classes. I have a construction company. I actually. I met Dustin originally whenever I had a tire shop. I was 15 years old when I opened the tire shop. I was bought out whenever I was 20. Dustin stuck with, with me through that 
at that time. But I can, but the number one thing that I, I believe matters in this situation is I know my mind frame being a business owner now of a construction company and a sawmill. And I know that my mind frame, whenever I was even 21, 22 to 25, is not the mind frame I have now at 31 years old. I, I constantly grow and I've seen Dustin grow nonstop throughout the years of the communications and everything that he's done and tried. He will forever have a home, a roof over his head, a job that I, and I'll work around his schedule with whatever classes he has to take. I will give him any tool that he could ever imagine to further not only working for me, but to eventually open his own thing to be something besides what he was so many years ago. He will forever have a hand with me forever. That's it. Okay, great, thank you. All right, family, Mr. Andrew moves on. Can y'all hear me? Can. I'm here to support him emotionally, physically, and stuff like that. If he needs any help, I'm here, you know, when he gets out and stuff. Right. Good. Okay. Um, Mr. Fortunate, is David there with you also? Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, go ahead, sir. Um, just wanted to say I'm ready for him to come home. He's got a huge support system here with us brothers stepmom dad he's got a home he's got work lined up people are willing to give him a job and i'm here to help him in any way i can like i've been doing and i just want y'all to know that he's got a good support system all right thank you appreciate it we appreciate y'all taking the time to speak with us today um, so, uh, Dustin, is there anything you'd like to say to us before we vote? I just hope I'll see that I'm not the same person that I was then so many so many years ago. Just hope y'all see I changed and y'all willing to give me a chance so I can prove to y'all, not just y'all, but my family, even the victim, that I'm not the same person, that I can be a better person. I will be a better person for family and all. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we're ready to vote. I'll be voting first. And, and you know, yours is a very difficult case, Justin. Yes, ma'am. A terrible crime, very young, um, very young victim. Uh, and, you, and you knew what you were doing. With. But when you were seen last, you were encouraged, uh, you were denied because you hadn't completed sex offender treatment. And you've yes, done that. And you, you're serving as a facility. Um, and so you've done everything we've asked you to do. Uh, my, I, I'm going to vote to grant your parole. It, it requires a unanimous vote, so I'm just one, but it would be after victim awareness class, but whenever that is, whenever they can get you enrolled in that, um, and then after release, of course, you'll have to comply with all the terms of your sex offender contract. You'll be required, there's some requirements there you'll be required to sign. you to submit to random drug screens by your PO, uh, of course, no contact whatsoever with the victim or the victim's family. And then you either have no unsupervised contact with any minor for the duration of your supervision or the duration of your con contract. Um, that's my vote. This is why. All right, uh, Dustin, I, uh, I want you to know that you prepared well for today. You don't mm -hmm. out of this. That's how that you were registered to her. So you, you know, you got engaged, you start doing, you start helping others. You did a great home, you healed yourself, and you start helping others. 
and you got good support here today. For those reasons, my vote is to grant this way after you complete the victim awareness of victim impact class. And I concur with the special conditions set forth. Best wishes to you. Ms. Jackson. And that's um, my vote is the same. All right. I'd like to. <laughs> Thank Gordon. you. Gordon, I think that concludes our business. We're going to adjourn. It's 11 10. Thank you all as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. <laughs> <laughs>
he took advantage of her. He he and he he went to prison for a long time for it. More so, more ta- time served than other cockroaches that have done worse things to to toddlers to their own grandchildren under the age of three. And that's where the sentencing thing just never makes sense to me. You know, I've said this before at other hearings. I, I, uh, I'm a Chris Hansen fan. I've listened, you know, of course, probably like you, if you're into him, watch all his stuff. He has a podcast that's great. I listen to all of it. And he brings up kind of like the three different types of, of predators, right? There's, there's the type that is absolutely obsessed with children. They just can't help it. It's what they live for think about, dream about, breathe about, their life revolves around it. You'll probably find content on their phone if you took it and and hard drives hidden in places. And they're the ones that will find a woman who has children and marry them just for, you know, that's like the worst class. The second class is uh, someone who isn't like that. But they're just impulsive. They're selfish. Maybe narcissistic. They're they um, they never thought about it. But wow, there's an opportunity. Wow, there's a 14 year old sleeping over. Ha ha! I'm gonna go take advantage. That's like the second class. And there's another form of that. I think there's the type that are very insecure. Um, they have a hard time uh, finding you know, women their own age and and then and they seek out younger people because they can impress them. They can feel better about themselves. You know, maybe, maybe everyone, you know, when you were 16, there was always that one person who was like 19 or 20 that hung out in your group and he had the car and he was so cool and he had money and, uh, and you only realize like kind of later on, it's like, that dude's a loser. Like, why is he hanging out with us? And it was because he's insecure. Um, at least that's what I think. And so I think that, that that's also another type. And then there's like the third type where they say, ooh, is it Romeo and Juliet? You know, is he a senior and she's a sophomore? And um, and it's interesting on his last podcast just last week, this is late June. If you're watching in late June, 2023, he, uh, he had someone that drove to meet a minor and he, um, he was, I don't know. I think he was like 20, 20 years old and, um, or to, to whatever, but he was going to meet a 15 year old and he was caught. And it turns out that he had a previous felony where he served prison time um well first he was given probation and then he failed his probation so he was given prison time but he was a senior and she was a freshman he was like 18 and she was like i don't know 14 or something and uh he got yeah he got probation and then violated it for like a driving charge or something and then went to prison so this was his second offense And that was interesting, the idea that it was his second offense, someone, you know, where you might have put him in that Romeo Juliet category, or maybe the insecure, insecurity category. Uh, But then he put it all in the line to do it again. So you, from seeing that scenario, I'm just forced to wonder, you know, which category does this guy lie in? Is he someone who obsesses over children or is he someone who's just impulsive and will take advantage but either way it's it's uh, you know it's it's scary he also didn't remember you know when miss renata asked him how come you were denied last time 
And he said, well, there was uh, like police opposition and some other opposition. I, I, I don't remember something. I don't remember. And Mr. Ross is like, yeah, there was other opposition, which we know was victim opposition. And he's again, played it off. Like he didn't remember, which is again, it's like manipulation. It's like, why don't you just say there was victim opposition? And there was that same opposition this time too. I believe that we heard it. It was kind of like read between the lines, but, it, but Ms. Ross said this other opposition. Now it, it, it's not the same thing. Like if a victim gets up and makes a statement or the, they may have kept him in for the full sentence. We don't know. We, we have seen plenty of times. We have seen when a victim came up crying on the phone. And it was terrifying. And uh, they didn't, they, they ended up not letting him out. But he only had like a five-year sentence. It was, it was. But maybe they would have kept him in longer. If, if if the victim had come up and done that, and we don't really, we don't have clarity around what happened, but in my opinion, straight up, if the victim said, I'm still dealing with this, I'm still traumatized, this has affected my life, he just needs to serve his full sentence. And I don't know, we just don't really have clarity about that. You just you just hope that he's not going to do something like this again. That uh, you know he has served a, a lot of time, a, a large. I kind of bore myself, frankly, watching this. <laughs> it's like putting myself to sleep. Uh, man, I seeing the first hearing, the second hearing, really kind of what stuck out to me was it was three years between. Uh, between hearings and he completed his programs. He claims that he, he requested to get into the other programs, but couldn't. And I really just wonder it's three years, dude. Like, do you really have no ambition to get like, do, uh, why wouldn't you just go and do all the programs to get out? Instead, it's, it's like the board says, hmm, well, did you take victim awareness? And he's like, well, I, I applied, but I couldn't get in. Oh, well, take victim awareness and you can get out. And it's like, yes. <laughs> like, um, what are you doing in there for three years, man? Uh, now the difference it makes when a family shows up. I mean, you know, the, 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 what, what is interesting, the more and more and more that I see these, these hearings, it's, it's the idea that he got, uh, what was it a 14 year sentence? I think six years I think it was a 20 year sentence was six years commuted. So it was 14 years. It's tw that's like, that's great, right? Like that's a long sentence. And then you say that he was 19, she was 14. He claims that he uh, confessed in the interview to being, he made himself younger, which made her younger. And again, like a, this, I believe that that scenario could play out. I believe the police would say things like that and, tr and trick you to, confessing to something, not realizing it, but also at the same time, seeing so many of these hearings for a judge to give such a strong sentence, I wonder, is it because it was the second felony? Maybe that's why the judge did it. Or was it going on longer than he's letting on at his parole hearing? Was she much younger? Um, but anyways, love to hear your thoughts. And also let me know what you think about when I go back in time and do these continuation hearings, how you feel about that. Um, but yeah, we can move on to the next hearing. Thank you. Rule number four. Officer Ward read from the Bill of Particulars on 11 1 2019. Your wife came to New Orleans Probation for all officers to speak with the agent Ward reference to you harassing her while going through the divorce. You called your wife during during she and the agent's interaction, at which time Agent Ward advised you to, to cease contact with her 
comes into the office on 11-7-2019 for a scheduled office visit. You arrive in New Orleans Probation Pro Office on 11-7-2019, at which time you're advised, at which time Agent Ward advised you to cease contact with your wife, in which uh, time you stayed, you would stay away from her, cause no more issues. On 3-2-2020, you're allegedly arrived at the victim's residence, banged on the front door, unwelcome, and docu as documented in New Orleans Police Item uh, C-0134-1, 342-19 on 3-3-2020, a protective order was filed against you in which you were never located or served. Agent Warren Ward received a copy of this protective order on 3-9-2020. Okay, on 3-11-2020, you allegedly arrived at your wife's residence unannounced, knocked the door, telling her to come outside. When your wife did not answer, you allegedly smashed her front vehicle windshield as documented on the New Orleans Police item C-13049-20. On 313, you allegedly arrived at the victim's residence again and followed her as documented in New Orleans item C-15861-20. You were arrested on 323-2020 for violation of protective order and domestic criminal damage in reference to the above police items. On 42-2020, Agent Onstop attempted to serve you a notice of preliminary hearing to which you refused to sign without attorney present. On 4 7 2020, Agent Onstop attempted to serve you a second time. You allegedly refused to sign off paper again and implied that you were you were going to violate yourself. You would kill your wife upon release from jail. You also allegedly implied you would harm Agent Ward as well. On left, April 11, 2020, the violation of protective orders was dismissed and the subject currently is on is only being charged with criminal damage to property. How do you plead? I plead, I plead not guilty. You plead not guilty to that? Yes, sir. Let's see if there's any more. Okay. All right. Something's coming up on my screen. Hey guys, y'all got me reviewing headquarters stuff. Yes, sir. We've got to get him to confirm his signature on that form since he doesn't have it in front of him. We're displaying it for him. Okay, all right. Well, it's just, just a moment. All right, let us know. They're going to send you something to look at, Nicholas. Yes, I've seen it already. Yeah, I've seen it already. Is that your signature? Yes, I've seen it. Yes, sir. Uh, for the record, he sees it, and it's signed, that's his signature signed on the uh, parole revocation questionnaire. You got it, staff? Yes, sir. All right, all right. He's got it. He agrees. All right. All right. Well, tell me, uh, so w were you ever arrested on these, any of these charges? No, sir. I was, I was not arrested. I was not informed on none of these charges, sir. So the time I had got uh, pulled over and they ran my name and they said it had a cash amount on it. So you're denying any of this happened with all these case documents, all these uh, New Orleans uh, docket numbers. No, so none of that happened. Are you just saying that that's the case or not? What do you what do you say? Did you did you go to your uh, ex-wife's house? Did you have co a contact with her? No, sir. I have no contact with her, sir. So you had, so you you never were threatened to uh, to anybody. No, sir. No, I'm not that type of person, sir. So you're currently being charged with criminal damage to property, correct? Yes, sir. What's the status of that? Uh, I was I was being I was being pressured to uh, plead out to that charge because it was sad if I take the trial, I would have to wait to my all the way to next year because of the pandemic. So, did you, so you pled to that charge? Yes, sir. I had to. I didn't have no charge. Okay. So you pled you, you, that charge is that. All right. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Jones. Got. Counselor, can you shed any light on this for us? 
Um, yes, I, I can. Um, I'm happy to, Mr. Jones. So yes, I know there are several item numbers that were listed by Agent Ward, but he has um, been he has not been arrested on any of them. And as far as I know, he does not have any arrest warrants stemming from those item numbers. The only one for which he was arrested was the one that included the simple criminal damage to property that's alleged to have taken place on March 11th. Um, and for that, he was arrested on a violation of a protective order with the simple uh, criminal damage to property. But upon investigation, the district attorney's office refused the violation of protective order because they found that there was no valid protective order on file. Um, and so that's why he, the case proceeded with only the simple criminal damage to property, um, which he did plead guilty to um, on like July 2nd. And he received credit for time served by the judge. Okay, so all that's holding him now is the parole revocation. Yes, sir. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Ms. Wise. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. I, uh, it, it, uh, the reason why the uh, protective order was dismissed is because he was not served. Uh, what is the status now of a protective order as it relates to your wife? Have you been served? You have not. Okay, so if you if you get if you are fortunate today and you get released, you're saying that you could actually go to your wife's house, and there will be no repercussions. Is that what you're telling me? No, ma'am, I cannot go around at all. At all. <laughs> How you know? Why, why you say that? It's because I know this this that struggle and me and all haven't been together in a while. And just put everything behind me. Uh, it's time for me to move on. I'm too old for this incarceration. Uh, don't, don't go all off into that. Let's not go all off into that. I just need to kind of answer some mm -hmm. questions. Now, your, your attorney said in the preliminary hearing that mere words do not constitute an assault. So therefore, therefore, uh, there was no charges filed but words are indicative of thought and you made threats to your wife that you're going to kill her if you get released and you made threats to the probation parole officer so tell me what what's going on with that help me understand that mm -hmm. that i would feel safe to let you back out on the street and and uh there will be no repercussions help me understand that Yes, ma'am. The, 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 the only way, the only way I can see this is, is that uh, when when the parole officer came to see me to get me to sign the paperwork, he must he must uh, mistook my words in the wrong way because I told him that I wasn't signing the paper without my attorney being present due to some of that reason that I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. Man. Okay. And what about the statement towards your wife that if you get out, you're going to go kill her? What about those statements? Oh, no, certainly, ma'am. I've never seen nothing like that, ma'am. All right. So you're saying you didn't say it? No, I didn't, ma'am. Okay, Chairman, that's all I have. All right. Would you like to make a statement on your behalf? No, I'm, I'm pretty fine, sir. Okay. Uh, Council, would you like to make another statement? Um, yes. Uh, so good morning, members of the parole board. My name is Cynthia Mesqua, and I am a public defender with the Orleans Public Defender's Office. Um, it has been my privilege to represent Mr. Nicholas Alexander over these past four months, during which I've had the opportunity to see who Mr. Alexander is as a person. I'd like to say upfront, clearly and unequivocally, that the board would be making the right decision in allowing Mr. Nicholas Alexander to return to our community under parole supervision. And I hope that this statement, um, after this statement and after considering this matter, you'll agree and lift the parole hold on Mr. Alexander. I'd like to first briefly address the violations alleged against Mr. Alexander. As a housekeeping matter, I'd like to make sure the board is aware that there are a few um, typo errors in the preliminary hearing report. The only individuals that gave testimony at the prelim were Agent Ward and myself. Agent Ward did testify to others' statements, but no one else called in or made any statements. Specifically, there's no one involved in this matter by the name of Shawanda Artis, and I think it was just a small typo when preparing the report. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, uh, from reading the narrative in Mr. Alexander's parole paperwork, he's accused of violating the condition of not engaging in criminal activity due to his arrest and implied threats while in custody. 
As to the arrest, um, Mr. Alexander was arrested on March 22nd on an arrest warrant, um, which I already explained, so I'll stick, uh, you know, move past this. Um, but I did share uh, the relevant communications with Agent Ward from the DA's office certifying that there was no basis for the violation of protective order charge. Um, and so I'd ask that the parole board consider his plea uh, to the simple criminal damage to property as the first technical violation. As to the implied threats that Agent Jeffrey Onstott reports, I'd like to highlight that these allegations are stemming from what Agent Onstott interpreted based on Mr. Alexander's words and demeanor. Um, the key word that I focus in on are implied threats that might help us, you know, visualize what were the actual statements that they were not direct threats, but merely implied threats. And Mr. Alexander, uh, we've spoken about this matter and he does apologize for his word choice and the tone in which he spoke as he did not and does not intend any harm to aid a ward or to Ms. Beatrice Sucre. As a legal matter in regards to criminal activity, Mr. Alexander's words do not rise to the level of even a misdemeanor simple assault. Louisiana courts have made abundantly clear that mere words do not constitute an assault, but only when there is a combination of threats, present ability to carry out the threats, and reasonable apprehension of receiving a battery. So the courts have clarified that there should be some attempt to carry out a battery in order to rise to a level of simple assault. And here we can easily and quickly see that Mr. Alexander's words do not rise to the level of criminal activity. And moreover, the allegations, you know, they really do concern implied threats, not actual threats. And that does not negate the impropriety of such comments, but it does reflect that Mr. Alexander's language did not constitute an actual immediate threat of harm and does not therefore violate his parole. Um, I'd like, now I'd like to turn um, to what Mr. Alexander would do if he were released on parole supervision. Um, as for where he would live, Mr. Alexander would resume living with his two uncles, Mr. Thomas Kraft and Reginald Kraft in New Orleans East. Mr. Alexander's uncles are further along in life and Mr. Alexander assists them with various tasks, such as cutting their hair and helping them stay on top of their medication. And these are actually the tasks Mr. Alexander regularly does for his family. His mother, Ms. Cheryl Alexander, and father, Mr. Vernon Alexander, they both live in an elderly facility. And while Mr. Alexander was on parole, he visited them multiple, multiple times a week and he helped them maintain a tidy living space. And you know, he would actually cut his father's hair twice a week. Um, Mr. Alexander also has two siblings. However, they both have young children, which is why Mr. Alexander has taken on the primary responsibility of visiting his parents. Um, he would also help them pay the expenses of living in an elderly care facility, as we know they can be quite expensive. His older brother, Mr. Vernon Alexander, is a manager at a restaurant in New Orleans, and his younger sister, Ms. Rogine, is a licensed pharmacy technician. Mr. Alexander has a single daughter, Ms. Ambria, who is currently in college with aspirations of being a doctor. I'd like to remind the board of the context of the times we're living in. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has been an incredible disruptor and source of anxiety for many. In times like these, family and community support make all the difference. If released, Mr. Alexander will return to his family in New Orleans, where he will, where he will immediately get to work to provide them with his support so that these hard times can be at least a little lighter. And I mean get to work quite literally. Mr. Alexander is something of a Renaissance man. He loves to work, he loves to expand his skill set, and he is a go-getter. Since his first job at 15, Mr. Alexander has not hesitated at any challenges and has continued learning new skills. At just 15, he got a job cleaning ballparks and drawing the lines on baseball and football fields. Then he started doing fender and body work on cars. In the interest of brevity, I'll summarize that he has completed the training and is licensed in checking ships' tanks for explosive materials or fuels that could lead to accidents before members of the Coast Guard board and inspect. He has worked in a shipyard operating forklifts and doing industrial painting and sandblasting. He completed a minority program at Dillard University where he received a certification for asbestos abatement work from the Department of Environmental Quality. And he began coursework for a massage therapist license, but had to withdraw when a work opportunity came up. These skill sets tell me that Mr. Alexander. Are you your car? I'm sorry, was someone asking a question? Yeah, okay, okay. Go ahead and wrap up, man. Okay, yes, I'm about to be done. Thank you. 
Um, this, these skill sets tell me that Mr. Alexander is not afraid of a hard day's work. He understands the value and importance of hard work. With these various skill sets, I am confident that Mr. Alexander will find work, even in a pandemic. In a sense, Mr. Alexander is the best prepared to find work during a pandemic because he has a variety of skill sets that he can turn to. He's not dependent on jobs in a particular field. In fact, Mr. Alexander's goal is to save enough money to go into business for himself. He wants to save up for a small truck and trailer that he can then use to find work. He's explained to me that with just a truck and a trailer, you could find work removing scrap metal from construction sites. You could deliver lumber, steel, or other large amounts of food products. And in a worst case scenario where work is scarce, um, with a truck and a trailer, you can even do smaller jobs, such as helping deliver large appliances or taking such appliances to waste sites. Um, and his business plan and idea demonstrate that Mr. Alexander is a problem solver and ready to be a productive member of our community. So in closing, I'd like to express my earnest and sincere support for who Mr. Alexander is. When he was first arrested and we met, he was in the midst of experiencing anxiety attacks regularly. On arrest, he was first taken to UMC for chest pains. And he's, so he has since started medication, which has helped. But what I noticed most is that Mr. Alexander has turned inwards to find peace and resilience. During our months of working together while he's been in custody, which is 142 days or four months and 20 days, Mr. Alexander has exhibited patience, faith, and resolve. I don't mean to suggest any of this has been easy because it hasn't. And I'll remind the board of the weight of knowing there's a pandemic particularly impacting elderly folks when your own parents are in an elderly facility. But through it all, Mr. Alexander has remained hopeful. And so I ask that you give Mr. Alexander an opportunity to return to his parole and adjudicate this matter as his first technical violation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Chairman, at this time, I recommend we go into executive, executive session to discuss confidential matters related to this case. I've got a motion for session. I got a second. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Kelsey? Yes. Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll be back in a minute. Well, okay, so I actually do have information on this case and we'll go through it at the end. I really do wonder what they're uh, talking about here at this executive session. It's gonna be interesting when I share with you what he's even in for. And it's just, it's mind blowing. But the, the 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 wait was about four minutes, so I'll skip it for you, so we don't need to sit through that. All right, I think we're back. Is everyone here as a panel prepared to vote? Yes. Uh, sir, I've, uh, we've listened carefully. There was a lot of case material, a lot to think about, a lot to process. Um, however, when it comes down to your conditions of parole, you've been around a while. You know with the conditions of parole, you need to be within the lines. And you were not. You, uh, you pled guilty to criminal damage to property, for that reason, my vote is to revoke your parole and let the original uh, parole, original sentence be imposed. All right, Mr. Jones. Uh, although you pled guilty to simple criminal damage to property, um, uh, I'm not certain that we would be here if that were the only thing that were ever involved. Uh, as, but as to everything that did get us here, uh, all we have is um, some allegations uh, that the police either didn't investigate or didn't um, act on, and the DA chose to not to pursue. So my vote today is to not revoke your parole. All right, you have uh, one vote to uh, do not revoke and one uh, vote to revoke. I also, you know, read and go carefully through the information that was provided to us, listen to counsel. 
all the information that was read. You, uh, you, you did uh, plead guilty to simple criminal damage, which is, is a criminal activity. And uh, we will, I'll vote to revoke. So you have two votes to revoke, one vote to do not revoke. Your parole's been revoked. Kelsey, Mr. So here's my understanding of what he was initially charged with and what he was revoked for. So he only got 180 days in probation for terrorizing an ex-girlfriend. Now, it, it's not clear to me, um, you know, because so this this sentencing took place in 2020. Now, this revocation hearing is also in 2020. So I just, I, you know, it's a little confusing, but he has the same first, middle, and last name and similar charges. So I, I'm pretty sure it's him. Um, but so he was, he, so he avoided further jail time from a domestic violence case from 2020, but he got his tongue lashing from the judge. Now, the county cir circuit judge uh, told the convicted abuser, Nicholas James Alexander, 43 that he was um, lucky to get a plea deal, recommending only time served. Um, he also took issue with several of the defendant's statements in court, including that the devil had a hand in the case, that everything happens for a reason. It happened for a reason. Yes, it did. It happened because he chose to terrorize her, the judge said in sentencing. What the state described was nothing short of terrorism, and the devil didn't do it. You know, it's interesting to hear the judge Give a real, you know, bashing, but then agree to time served. Um, at Alexander's sentencing, the prosecutor Bitney Haver and the Duchess County, and, and the Duchess um, County District Attorney's Office outlined the background of the latest case. December 13, 2020, the victim had been trying to stay away from Alexander. He located her in a Walgreens parking lot in Redmond and used his vehicle to block hers. He yelled at her and he broke uh, one of her car mirrors. She was forced to use her, her car to push his out of the way and flee. Later, she was outside the Walmart when he approached her. She ran to the store entrance, but he grabbed her, tossed her phone to the ground, and started dragging her to his vehicle. Multiple witnesses called 911. So he's doing this in broad daylight. Um, and employees intervened, but then he escaped before the police would come. Then... Uh, officers agreed, agreed to keep watch in the woman's hotel room that evening as agencies worked to find him. And around 7.30 that night, sure enough, he parked near the hotel and slipped past the law enforcement officers. Can you imagine? The police are there stationed, but he, he gets past them. He enters the woman's room, but she wasn't there. He spotted her outside the hotel and chased her into her van, then back to her room. And meanwhile, the police are there. You know, you just imagine they're like eating donut or something. And uh, he sneaks in. Can you imagine the terror? The terror of that? Like he's terrorizing her all day. And then even with police sitting outside her hotel room, he sneaks in and then chases her around the hotel. And she has to call 911. Then he smashed a hotel window, causing $258 in damage, and chased her out of her room. He was eventually tracked down the next day in an attic in Culver and arrested. He was charged December 20th with 14 counts, including Class A felony, first degree, unlawful, unlawful. How did they, what does that mean? Like, you know, like what? what how, what does that even mean, and and why 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 would he not be charged fully for that? Uh, he came to court Wednesday, having arranged a plea deal involving 180 days in jail, time that he already served, and three years probation for the incident in Walgreens and Walmart. He pleaded guilty to one count of each of, of coercion for the hotel attack. He pleaded guilty menacing endangering someone, protecting by restraining order, and all charges were dropped. I lost everything when I met Nick. The victim told the court, the ripple effect of his abuse are way too much for me. I went into one letter. The problem with Nick is that he follows through on about half the threats he makes, and I never know from one day to the next which threat he was going to follow through on. 
Over a rambling one-minute statement to the court, Alexander blamed – oh, a rambling nine-minute statement to the court. It sounds like his attorney. He blamed his problems on drugs and the devil. I said, everything happens for a reason. Don't you love it? Everything – that's not the first time we've heard that. Everything happens for a reason. He said the victim had tried repeatedly to contact him despite the restraining order she had against him. Now the judge says, I think Mr. Alexander had made about 500 excuses. The judge said after Alexander was finished, really, I'm not persuaded by anything he said. I hope I'm wrong. I hope a scintilla of what he's saying is accurate. I hope that he does make improvement for everybody's sake, not just his, but all the victims he creates with his behavior. In the end, the judge went along with the plea deal, the caveat that if he violates probation, he'll serve a minimum of four years in prison. So here's a judge that's really giving it to him. It seems in his his best knowledge doesn't really believe anything that he says, doesn't appreciate it, and then he gives him just four years probation. Uh, four years, sorry, um, if he if he uh, is revoked. And again, this is my understanding because the dates are a little you know uh, interesting, but. Um, the dates just don't really add up to, for, for me here, which is why it's concerning because this, because this hearing took place on, on August, 2020. It's uh, it's not clear. It's really not clear to me if it's the if it's the same person because a pro revocation hearing took place on August eleventh of twenty twenty, and it says that this happened um, on December thirteenth, twenty twenty. So it's yeah. And, you know, Richard didn't provide this link. This is what I found on my own. So it, it would be interesting if it's not him and it's just someone with the same name in a similar situation. But otherwise, it would add up to him being him if, the you know, could be the dates in the article are wrong. And I'm sorry about that. There's just not much. I'll put the link in the description if you want to check it out yourself. But it kind of is similar, same name, uh, similar dates. Um but if it is him, then what it would mean is that the judge did let him off easy, and then we see him basically immediately getting revoked for doing something pretty much similar to what to what we had seen. But you know, it is interesting when we do these hearings; we do see um, a lot of very similar, a lot of identical names, similar ages with similar crimes, and it is quite. It can be quite confusing at times. But then, uh, you know, my last thought would be on his attorney. Um, you know, she graduated from, from Stanford, which is, I think, the number three, like, school in the, in, in, in the world, maybe. And I thought at the beginning she was doing a good job bringing up, like, the, the facts and the laws uh, uh, based on, on, you know, New Orleans legislation, but then she just kept going on and on and on and on and on. And maybe that's part of her strategy, but not a good look in my opinion. Uh, Keith looked looked pretty annoyed by that. And but uh, what can you do? She had her she had a she had a work up caught up against her. Can you just imagine though? You you graduate. Uh, Stanford, and then you choose to become um, a public defender. I mean, how do you, you know, I gotta tell you, that's, that is saying something. You have to really have ideological views to do that. Um, but anyways, with that, I'll let you go. The first felony offender, offense, manslaughter, <clears throat> Parole date is August 1st, 2021, good time, April 14, 2030, full term, April 10th, 2037. Is this information correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms.
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? All right. Good. Is this your first hearing? My second one. Your second hearing. Okay, good, good. Call out for the record how much time you served on this 40 year sentence. I've done 24 years. 24 years. And I'm showing you have 378 days of programs. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, just call out the top three that meant the most to you. Mine was celebrate recovery. Mm -hmm. The next one was thinking for a change. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed I enjoy A A N A. Um, all of them. Each okay. one has helped me. Good. Have you? Uh, and I know you. Uh, have you had anything with victim awareness? I know you went through the uh, the program with the with the. Uh, have you had the victim awareness class? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Okay, all righty. Uh, what is your education level now? I went through uh, literacy. I finished that. I'm almost to get my GED. Uh, I'm close. I've been working hard on it. Good, good for you. I know that feels good. Yes, yeah, that really feels good. Uh, in terms of write-ups, uh, I think you've had one write-up in the 24 years you, uh, you've you been down. Is, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. It was, it was in 2006, just one. Okay, I thought it was 2004, but okay, 2006. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi. Okay. I said no. You probably you're probably right. Uh, I was reading uh, your the letter that your son wrote to us, and he said that he has watched you grow over this time. You went from not accepting responsibility for the offense, you know, the thing about, about the allegation of rape, to accept the responsibility. So, so where do you yes. stand today as to the offense? I am so sorry. I take full responsibility for this. Uh, I, I, I love that. I love their son. And I want to give back to them something, you know. Uh, I take all full responsibility of this. Good. Okay. And, and and the allegation of rape that you had made, or what is your statement about that today? Well, I'm just stating, I'm just taking the full responsibility of this child now. Okay. That it was my fault. I did this. See, I didn't say all that before. Mm -hmm. But now I understand my gambling was addiction. I didn't understand a lot of that. But now I do. Okay. So the the the, the AA uh, talking about your addiction. So what was your motivation for taking the AA NA classes? Well, that, that was what we had here only. But mm -hmm. I learned more. That's why. Uh, when I get out, I have a class for gambling only. You know, mm -hmm. it's gonna help me. Okay, so tell me about. Is that a, go ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead and tell me about. Tell me about the class you got outside. It's at a church, and it's a gambling program, and they want to help me, support me, help me understand more about this. Uh, that's the celebrate church that your son was mentioning. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So tell me about uh, drugs, alcohol. Have you ever? Have you ever had a problem with alcohol? You didn't. You no, didn't drink. You're not, not drinking. Never. What about marijuana. Marijuana. Never. I don't even know what a drug. I, I'm being honest. Okay. I don't okay. even I, know what a drug is. Nothing. What Never. about alcohol? A, occasional glass Never. of wine, a beer. None of Never. that. Never. Never. Do you, uh, so do you remember how you got started on gambling? Do you Do you remember? Yeah. What, how old were you? How old were you? Mm, it was around, I was in my 40s. I was in a 
coffee shop and somebody just introduced me, a, a stranger, just some ladies just introduced me to this. And I started playing it. So as so, all, otherwise I would have never stepped in this. Okay. And the, okay. Uh, I see you've been involved in the JCs. Uh, yeah. What kind of things you, you did in the JCs? We helped each other. We talked. We cooked. Uh, we made things for each other or for the community. We went out and helped the community to get some more meetings started and stuff like that. Okay, and I, I and and looking back and saying, two thousand six, the uh, the warden had a letter where you was at the governor's house with the Chapel Foundation. What did you do there? What was what was we your involvement? Went, we went there, and we was the one could sing. It was a group of us, about fifteen, okay. 15 of us. Okay, good. And we got around the piano, good. and we would sing to all of them. Good. So we. That's good. And then uh, you was you was a part of the first, I guess, one of the first faith and character dorms, right? You participated in that yes, in two thousand five. Okay. And we had a lot of programs we learned from from that, okay. like being rooted in God and to understand what He is within us. He lives within us. And we're real rooted in him and accept him in our lives. And that's okay. what it faith based was about. Number one was about God. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Uh, and I also saw the article that you put in your packet. That that was very interesting. Uh that the victim's mother wrote. Okay. Yes. Oh yes. I didn't know you had it. Yeah, you well, we had, yeah, we had it. <laughs> Yeah, we had you. You shared it. You sent it in. Uh, so, how was the victim <laughs> dialogue? How was that for you? That that dialogue with the mother. How was how was it a victim assistance dialogue? How did how was that for you? When, when you met with the mother of the child, I don't understand what when you talked to the victim's mom recently or a few years no, it was, it was, it was years ago it was years, years ago. ago she came to saint gabriel and she had her arms open and held me and told me she forgave me for what happened she knew i loved her son mm -hmm. so that's it was awesome and then we took community together uh in this room, they had like fixed like a church, and we had communion. We talked. We said, "She said she forgave me," and I told her I was so sorry mm -hmm. for this. It, it was negligent. I'm sorry I, this happened. Did were you ever made aware of the cause of death of the child? I, 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 back then, I didn't remember okay. some of yeah. it. Okay. All right. Thank you for answering my questions. That's all I had. Chairman, that's all I had. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I don't see there are any other questions. So, Ms. <laughs> uh, Teresa, I'd like you to introduce those who've indicated they'd like to speak. Yes, ma'am, we will now hear from Andrew Hunley from Louisiana Pro Project. Good morning, Andrew Hundley, uh, here to share with the board that Terry is a client uh, of Louisiana Parole Project. If she's granted parole, she will come to our reentry program in Baton Rouge, uh, where she will be a resident at Redemption Homes. Uh, she will have the full support of our organization. Uh, and she will go through our program just as any other client would, where she will um, go through our intensive reintegration programming, where she will have access to training 
on, on technological skills, consumer skills, uh, will ensure that she has um, <clears throat> access to health care uh, and that she will have a mental health assessment. Uh, and we will also ensure uh, that follow up um, on that assessment, but especially as it relates to her gambling issues, uh, is seen through. Um, I'd like to share, uh, obvious what this board has in front of them, Terry uh, is 68 years old. She served 25 years uh, for this crime. Nothing that, that she can do will be able to undo the harm uh, that she caused, but it should be noted uh, that based on her age, she's a very low risk uh, to reoffend. In addition to that, with the support of our organization, uh, with her behavior, uh, over the last 25 years and what she's done to better herself in the institution being an indicator of how she's grown uh, <clears throat> and also with strong family support uh, we anticipate that terry uh, will have a strong re-entry over the next few years uh, if she's given the opportunity to come home uh, we, we would like to indicate that she has no plan to return to jefferson parish uh, that her sister um, that where she her long term residence is in St. Tammany Parish, uh, and we would work with her family to ensure that even after she's uh, finishes our program and relocates that she continues to have mentorship uh, from our organization and our volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Miss Patricia Donahue, who's a friend. I met Terry about 32 years ago. I was a volunteer to teach illiterate adults how to read, and she was randomly assigned to me. And we met at a uh, St. Timothy Methodist Church, and I was just always so impressed how excited she was to learn. And she was dedicated and determined and dependable, um, and just always brought a sweet spirit. But learning was just the most important thing to her. And then she was. Um, uh, she had a job as a nanny in my subdivision. She'd often bring the little children over um, to visit with me, and you could just see how much those little children loved her, and she loved them as if they were her own. And I have visited her in prison since she was first incarcerated, and um, to me, she has always taken responsibility for what she did to Jared. And um, over the years, she just, I, I would say, have you put in papers to go before the parole board? No, I just don't feel like I have paid the price yet. And, um, and I haven't been forgiven, but just, I guess maybe the last four or five years, I've seen a sense of peace come over her. And she has felt that she has finally paid the price for that. Um, I've always been impressed with um, that she doesn't get in trouble. She's a model offender. I see her smiling and she's got a good relationship with everyone. At the, at the prison. She works very hard. She does, she's not idle with her time. She's in school as often as they allow her to. She sends me copies of her certificates so I can um, be proud of her and see how hard she's been working on her reading, writing, and her math skills. And she's also been trusted as a trustee position in the front office for many years. And she's a good Christian woman. And when she returns to her room in the evening after doing all the work, whether it's on the prison gardens or whatever she's been assigned to, she she reads scriptures and she just loves God and she wants everyone to know um, how much God loves her and how much he loves everyone else. And um, I, I feel like um, she's being, been rehabilitated. She's come to know herself better in her relationship with God and that she truly is sorry for the death of little Jared. So I plead mercy on Terry's behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hear from Ms. Heidi Chin, who's the daughter. Yeah, hello. I've uh, known, uh, this is my mom, so I've known her for 43 years. And I've always known her to have a kind heart. And um, as others have said, uh, to just be a person who is upbeat. Um, as we were growing up, she brought us into, taught us the faith and brought us into the church and 
which I'm grateful for for many years now and, and uh, started our relationship uh, in that way with God and spent much time on homework and, and meals and taking good care of us and, and showing us love and affection. And um, I, I also feel she has a strong work ethic um, she, and she's been there for a very long time. Her family has missed her in these 25 years. Over time, she's uh, had five grandchildren that she's never met. And um, my brother recently, very, very recently lost his wife to cancer and has two little boys that he's raising on his own. And uh, he wrote a letter in as well to, um, to talk about how much he missed his mom and that uh, would like them to meet them one day, uh, meet her one day. And um, so as far as speaking with her on the phone, I've seen a change uh, as others have said, uh, she's come around to talking about um, what happened and being able to admit to that. And, um, you know, whereas that, that wasn't happening before. And I believe that she has, um, gone from the programs I've heard that she's gone through. She's called me and, and told me about getting her GED and working on, on that and uh, spending time in school. I, I believe um, through talking with family that perhaps uh, there was uh, some dyslexia there and things. So I know she's had to work extra hard and I'm, I'm told her that I'm very proud of her for what she's accomplished. And, um, I've just seen her use her time there for betterment. And um, I just wanted to say that um, her sister, uh, my Aunt Sharon, I've spoken with her and she set up um, a place, she has a place for her to live, re uh, job opportunities lined up, ready to go. And um, her family, um, my brothers and sisters and I, um, and, and her uh, family are much in support and are there to listen and help uh, when she is out and anything that we can do. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you. We will now hear from our opposition, Mr. Randy Meyer. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. Um, I communicated with Dr. Sternberg, father of the, of the child, <clears throat> and he had told me that he would defer to the parole board on their decision. He said that being said, he would support parole given the time served, her age, and the lack of intent that led to the tragic death of his son. I also spoke with his former wife, Mrs. Stern, Ms. Sternberg, who's now remarried. Um, she said that she has forgiven Ms. Revere, uh, but she was also concerned with, um, I guess it comes to, uh, you know, one of the, the, the statements she made about that rape, uh, the alleged rape and, and her failure to take responsibility for what was done. And uh, Ms. Sternberg told me that if, uh, if we felt that Ms. Revere took full responsibility with, for what was done, she would not oppose her request for parole. Um, and I appreciate Ms. Wise's questions basically to that effect. Uh, when Ms. Wise asked her about the rape allegation, she didn't answer yes or no, but she, she responded that she, that it was her fault. She did it and that the gambling was an addiction, uh, which, Clearly, with the facts of this case, case clearly, um, was, it was a main cause of this tragic death. Um, I think, based on her answers, uh, Ms. Sternberg would would agree with me that, or, or I think Ms. Ms. Sternberg would would say she takes no position in this in this request. We will defer to the victims in that regard. However, I would request if this board does grant her. Um, that some gambling anonymous co uh, classes are required of her. Um, <clears throat> that clearly was uh, clearly was a problem that she experienced. She hasn't had any gambling anonymous. They may not have that in the facilities. So I think that would be something that probably would be good for her to participate in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, 
Warden LeBlanc, is there any input yeah. from yeah. the facility? Um, you know, I want to just echo everything that was said before. Um, you know, she has been with us a number of years, 20 plus years, and only had one write up. And I think the one write up she had was back in 2004. So that's been a considerable amount of time that she was with us since she's had the write up before and after. Um, she does have good plans, some family support. Um, you know, she goes with the parole project for help. Then her uh, sister has housing for her, a job lined up. Um, she's a minimum status offender. She does help with orderly kind of cleanup work. And I think that's what her job would entail once she got out on the outside. And throughout her years with us, um, before I even got here, she has, you know, a whole stack of certificates where she has been participating in this community that she's been housed in. Um, so, you know, she's done everything we needed or we've asked um, her to do. She has been participating in education. And even though she's getting closer, I'm not certain that that's something that can be accomplished. Um, it's good that she has brushed up on her skills and her reading and her literacy, but she's been hanging in there. So we just wanted to add, you know, all of those things have already been said, but we just wanted to mention that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Revere, is there a statement you'd like to make to the, the panel before we before we vote? Yes, I want to thank you for giving me this time. I I pray that y'all would show mercy to give me a second chance to this. I want to say I take full responsibility for this end and keep it up, keep up my classes, keep up everything, what I've learned through all these classes. Yes, ma'am. Thank all you. Right. Uh, I think we're prepared to vote. We'll be starting with Ms. Wise. Yes, thank you. I uh, Warren, I, I apologize for not uh, asking you your comments earlier. I, I just forgot. Um, we had a lot to consider today, uh, Ms. Revere. You, uh, you've, uh, you prepared for this day. You, you, uh, and I want to commend you for that. You really prepared for this day. Uh, I'm going to vote to grant your parole uh, because of the low risk. You need two more votes, so you, this is only one. And because of the low risk, your good programs and the warden's comments, and you do have a good transition plan uh, that you go to the Louisiana Parole Project. And it's very essential that you stay there for a sufficient amount of time. I know your family is ready for you to come back, but you, you know, 24 years is a long time. So they are experts. So trust their wisdom about how long you should stay there. Uh, and, and, and as DA has said, uh, be involved in government anonymous classes. Uh, stay involved in that. And I would like to see you to continue to work towards your GED. I, I just, you know, just continue to work on it. It's not a condition, but I encourage you to continue to work on it. Uh, best wishes to you, uh, ma'am. Mr. Mayor Bella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Revere, you have uh, done a lot of very positive things while you've been in prison. And I have to be very honest with you. I was very concerned about this case when I read those rape allegations. That bothered me. It bothered me significantly. Uh, I think you've cleared that up. I think you've accepted your responsibility yes. for that. Uh, what happened was horrible, and I'm sure it was very difficult for you to even face that. So I guess there's a part of me that understands why you might have said, given some sort of uh, excuse for that. Uh, I'd like to say to Mr. Meyer, Mr. Meyer, uh, I have always appreciated your opinions. You're a credit to your office. Uh, when, when, when you have an opinion, I listen very closely to it. And I appreciate your comments and the things that you've said here today. Uh, Ms. Uh, Revere, uh, I likewise uh, believe that you've earned the right to uh, uh, early release. Uh, I do share Mr. Meyer's concern about Gamblers Anonymous. I'm going to go a little further than what Ms. Wise said. I'm going to make it as a condition that you attend Gambling Anonymous classes, and if there is Gambling Anonymous meetings to go to, I want you to go to at least two of those meetings a week. Uh, 
at least for six months and perhaps more as out as requested by your parole officer uh, once you were released. Uh, so my vote today would be to uh, grant your parole under the same conditions as Ms. Wise with that added condition of a little more stringent uh, Gamblers Anonymous. So good luck to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Revere, I do agree with my colleagues. My vote today also is to grant for the same reasons that have been stated already. Do you understand the special conditions? Yes, I do. So that is to the to the parole project and then the the, the uh, eventual residence plan in St. Tammany. Yes, yes. Good luck to you, ma'am. Thanks everybody for participating today. <laughs> So I wish I could share more information on this. Thank you, Destiny, for bringing this case to my attention. She emailed it to me. Always, if you see a case that that uh, she said, "Hey, I don't see this in your in your playlist," and she was right. Um, now I just jumped in and recorded it without asking Richard to do any research, and I did some googling. and And what you see that comes up with this name is that it's included. In so, like, if you Google her name, it comes up in like ten articles. But all the articles, it seems that they always bring her up when when there is a, another case of someone leaving a child in a car. They then bring this up as an example. Uh, but there was no, I couldn't find details. I couldn't find a court hearing. I couldn't find what they were talking about, the allegations of sexual assault. My takeaway was that she claimed that she wasn't playing poker. She claimed that she was attacked and sexually assaulted. And that's why the baby was left in the car. Um, the, the little bit of information that I did find was that, yeah, she was the nanny. She was the nanny and she locked the child in the car. So she had a van, which she locked and then went and played poker. And that's just, she claimed she, she was completely sober. She's so you're telling me that your addiction is so strong that you would knowingly sober with a sober mind lock the child that you're the nanny for in a car. That is sick stuff. And you know, Randy, the assistant DA who shows up to pretty much all the hearings in his parish. He spoke to the father, he spoke to the mother, he, he did his homework. He, but I, my takeaway, I didn't feel that she took responsibility. When Miss Waz was asking the questions, she still seemed like she was in denial about it. She said, uh, um, I'm sorry it happened. Not, I'm sorry I did it. Not, I, you know, I'm sorry it happened, which is the classic, disgusting response that we get from most monsters. And um, she also said, I can't remember how it happened when she was questioned. She didn't straight up say that she wasn't like, I did not feel she took accountability. I did not see it. I did not see accountability. I still saw denial and trying to like sleek sleaze away from the, the, from taking accountability and from answering the questions. That was my personal. She said it was negligent. It was negligent. I'm sorry it happened. Not I was an idiot. Not I had like it, it just I did not see the accountability. No. And you know, you might say, well, she had a 40 year sentence. She served 24 of it. What chances are that she's gonna hurt someone else? All that stuff. Uh, you know, and you can take that approach. I mean. But there's something, you've got to be something very wrong with, with a human being that, see, there are people that leave children cars and they forget. It really is negligence. This was not negligence. She deliberately took a child that she was trusted and paid to watch as her job. She took the child to a casino, locked it in the car, and gambled while the child cooked a lot in the car. And then she made up allegations that she was sexually assaulted. And it seems from what the hearing that she held on to that. 
there's something very wrong with this person and I have no empathy for her at all. And I would have been fine if they denied her, frankly. That's just my two cents. What's that? I'll let you go. First allegation, uh, the only allegation, is that on January the 17th of 2022, you were involved in criminal activity in the commission of the offenses of aggravated sexual second degree battery, aggravated assault with a firearm, second degree sexual battery, resisting an officer, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon in East Baton Rouge Parish. You were arrested by the Baton Rouge Police Department on January the 17th of 2022. According to court minutes for docket number EBRDC 22-011499, you pled guilty to disturbing the peace uh, by fistic encounter on August the 28th of 2023 and was sentenced by Judge Lewis Daniel to 90 days in the parish prison with credit for time served. The charges of aggravated battery and possession of illegal firearm by a convicted felon were dismissed. How do you plead to those allegations? I plead to the allegations of um, disturbing the peace, this altercation. I plead guilty to that. As to the other allegations that you committed all these other activities, you plead not guilty? Not guilty. They would throw out. All right. Uh, your case has been assigned to Mr. Pete Freeman. Mr. Freeman will begin our questions. Please answer any questions he might have. Okay, Mr. Lavis. Uh, you're a lifer, correct? Yes, sir. So you're facing life if you get revoked today. Yes, sir. Yet you say you got in a fight with a woman. I got in a fight with a woman? Yeah. We didn't have we didn't have a fight. We oh, had right. an argument. My ear just started bleeding. Well, her ears, her ear and her mouth been like that. That's been like that. I didn't do that. The police officer seen it and he thought that that had just occurred. She refused medical treatment to determine whether or not those scars was recently or something in the past. So I didn't have any evidence to prove but that. Tell, tell me what happened between you and this lady. And we have all the arrest reports, all the statements. You tell me what went on. We was together that night and we had been drinking. And we left my apartment. And after that, I can't really tell you much of whatever ha what else happened because, like I said, her and I had been drinking. Y'all using any drugs? No, we didn't use any drugs. Just you alcohol. Did Just you have alcohol. a gun? Sir? Did you have a gun? No, sir, I didn't have a gun. Where did the gun come from? Was uh, That was right where y'all were arguing. The officer said that I had a that I had a gun. He said he found a gun in the grass. I have documentations to show that my fingerprints wouldn't on the gun. Why did you take DNA? Why you refused the DNA? I refused the DNA. I was drunk. I didn't know I, I had been drinking. I had been Why drinking. Why did you run? All honesty. I didn't run. When they came, I didn't know that the police was coming after me. I walked fast to get away from her. So you knew this lady before? Yeah, I knew her. I knew her from um, being around the house. Yeah, she states she had never seen you before that morning. Yeah, I, I know she said that Brittany, Brittany will say something like that. Brittany stay in physical altercation with people. What about the DWI you received? Oh yeah, I was guilty of that. I pled guilty to that. So you've been drinking since you got out? Yes, sir. I had been drinking like when I when I'm off from work, like on the weekends. Where you worked at? City Club, right across the street from the courthouse. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, I have no uh, no further question. Yes, sir. Uh, they yeah. give us 
some indication in the report that several callers called in saying they witnessed you beating her. No, I didn't beat her. You don't know nothing That's about that. I didn't beat her. I know Brittany, and I know Brittany Ben had those no, no, calls. No, no, sir. no, sir. Uh, the police department got several calls from other witnesses who witnessed you out there beating her. No, I didn't beat her. I didn't beat her. They were, they were anonymous calls. Do you know yeah. anybody who would I, do that? Who, who, you know, who would do that? No, I don't know anybody. I can't tell you nobody that would do that. But, uh, so were you standing there when uh, when she told the police that you attacked her because she refused to have sex with you? Were you there when she said that? No, I wasn't there. I read it in the report. Oh, you read it in the report? I read it in the report, yeah. Speak to that. Speak to that. No, you Me? tell us. Yeah, 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 speak to that. What, what do you say to that? That We got what she said. Now, what do you say? I didn't. I never. I never. I never. Um, I never attacked her. I never had sex no, with her. About the sex part, the, the argument. She said the argument came about because she refused to have sex with you. What do you say to that? We got yeah. what she said. What do you say? No, that's not true. That's not true. Had y'all had sex that day? No, we didn't have sex. You said that y'all had just left your apartment. My apartment, yeah. Going where? We was going to the store. Um, MJ's. The store on uh, Florida Boulevard. For what? For to get something to eat, something to drink, something to snack on. So to get more alcohol? No, I had enough of that. I oh, had okay. enough of that. So y'all just had the munches. We just had the munches, yeah. And, and she, so, go ahead. she she was drunk and I was drunk, and I'm being honest. So why was the police called? To your knowledge, why was the police even called? People walk to the store all the time. I guess somebody thought they saw something that happened. I mean, were y'all like playing? Like, you know, like sometimes you play with each other because y'all both drunk. Which I, I mean, well, I'm just, I'm just. I'm, to I'm that. saying that I was drunk and I can't remember everything that occurred. That's what I was saying. Okay. I can't remember everything. Can you even remember what y'all were talking about? You knew y'all were hungry. Y'all was hitting you, you had the money, right? You was gonna buy the stuff. The yeah, I had the money. Yeah, I was okay. gonna buy this. I had a credit card. Okay. You don't remember anything about what y'all talked about on the way? Oh, no, we didn't do much talking. You didn't do much talking. Y'all just walking side by side. Just walking side by side. You know this that, that doesn't make you know, I'm trying to get I'm trying to understand too. I realized you were under influence. But you have no idea how much have you consumed that day of alcohol? Uh, two cans of club tail and some other um a big can of um a big can of beer. Okay, so you you mix beer and what what's the club tail? I don't know what that club is. Club tail is like the alcohol. What kind of is it gin, bark? What what kind of alcohol? No, it's like a It's not like a vodka, it's lighter than a vodka. It's like 99% um, alcohol. Okay. I'm trying to be as honest as possible in what I can remember, ma'am. Okay, that's right. You can, you can remember what you was drinking, but you don't remember once y'all start walking to the store or what happened. But you can... I kind of probably blanked out. I, I had too much. I had, had too much. Okay, and neither one of y'all could say, well, let me send you to the store. Uh, yeah, yeah. But y'all didn't do that. Both y'all wasn't, both of y'all felt like you could make it to the store. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm trying to understand, sir. All right, that's all I have. And, and you say you know Miss Snow? It wasn't just somebody you met that night? I no, it wasn't somebody I met that night. I know it from being around the house up under the bridge, the North Boulevard Bridge, where they pass out clothes and everything. I didn't met around there a few times. I, how did she get in your apartment? Huh? How did she? How was it? She was in your apartment that night. She came. We we met at um uh, we met at club. We met at um MJ's that day, and she agreed to come with me. What were you going? She coming? Why did she agree to come with you? Where were y'all going? What were y'all going to well, do? I had I had intentions on having sex with her, but we did. Uh It was my intentions to really have sex with her, but we did. So. She says it was all about sex. You say no, it wasn't, but yet it was your intention to have sex with her. Why would she say you had a gun? I don't know. 
And, and I find it curious that she said you had a gun. She said you hit her with a gun and the police found a gun. I mean, that's uh, that's quite a coincidence. The courthouse dismissed it because they didn't find my fingerprints on it. I, I, I'm not interested in what the courthouse did. Yeah. We're our own body to find our own facts. All right. DAs drop charges all the time because they don't want to prosecute them or whatever. Yeah, I didn't have no gun. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? I do have one other. Wait, wait, wait just a second, Ms. Wise. Did you, uh, I'm looking at your parole certificate. You were ordered to the parole project. What happened with that? Did you complete their program? Yeah, I completed the program. When did you leave the parole project? I left it out 2001, 2000, 2020. Around I, got out, I got out in 2019. I yes, completed it in 2020. And so you were living at St. Joseph's home after your parole project was done with. Ma'am? You were still living in St. Joseph's home when the parole project? Yeah, and he allowed me to come back. Oh, he they allowed, allowed me, you to come back? He allowed me to come back. That's where I was staying at. So you didn't have anybody that you could talk to, but you started to believe that maybe your mm -hmm. alcohol consumption was getting out of hand. And with the parole project, you didn't go ask anybody for help. You didn't have a sponsor. Were you going to AANA meetings, anything? No, I didn't ask anybody. If you had stopped doing that. You had stopped going to AA meetings? No, I was still going to the meetings. That was a requirement to um, go to the meetings when you're um, living over there. <laughs> but I never asked anybody for the help me. And you weren't honest in the meetings either, sound like. Huh? You weren't honest in the meetings. You didn't go in there and say, y'all, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm drinking. You didn't, you didn't do that. Yeah, Ms. Linda knew. Ms. Linda knew I had a drinking problem. She had talked about it. Me and her in talked the, about it. In the AA meetings. Okay, that's all I have. All right. Mr. Lavis, what would you like us to know before we vote? Sir? What would you like to tell us before we vote? I would just like to have another chance, another opportunity to prove myself. I know I messed up. I'm trying to be as honest as possible with all the questions, but like I say, I don't remember everything that occurred because I was drunk. And all I wanted just be considered for another opportunity. Not a bad person. I'm not hard to get along with, but some of those allegations aren't true. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. I'm ready to vote. Uh, yes. Okay, Mr. Freeman. Okay, uh, Mr. Lavis. Uh, you know, you was given a chance on a life sentence, which not only affects you, it affects everybody else that's coming up for a life sentence. It's something that's looked on very close. Um, you pled guilty to do di two different criminal charges. One was a DWI that was revoked. One involved a gun that you claim is not yours, but you played the fistic encounter with anonymous phone calls saying y'all were fighting. Um, the officer said she was bleeding from the ear. Um, I, I plumb don't understand. Be honest, you face it life. I don't understand it. My vote is to remove. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, Ms. Lives. Uh, Mr. Lives, I, I've looked at this every which way I could I can look at it. Uh, and what, what's so upsetting to me is that you had tools available to you. You knew what they are to get the help that you need when you start struggling in the area. You had all the tools you need, but you didn't use the tools. And that's concerning for me. So my vote is the same for the same reasons. Mr. Uh, Lavis, you have two votes to revoke. My vote is likewise the same for the same reasons as my colleagues have stated. When your parole has been revoked, good luck to you. So what would that mean? It means you're going back right. to serve your life sentence. Wait.
I think he thought that Mr. Mirabella said, wait, and that he was going to get some type of new opportunity. That's, oh, man, that's a... Uh, no, I think Mr. Mirabella was just shutting down. This was the final hearing of the day. So I don't know for those of you, he just, it's hard to, to process what just happened, right? He, he was just told, you're going back in for life. What you just did, what was really a, a misdemeanor, what you took, uh, and he spent 90 days time served is actually putting you back in prison for life. Now, we're going to go over the details of his case that initially got him locked up, how he was set free, what the parole project had said about him. Uh, Richard pulled up all the information. It actually wasn't so simple because there were typos in, in the initial uh, Louisiana parole board uh, when it came to to, to listing his docket. So thank you, Richard, for, for finding it. You know, something that's interesting to me is that no one from the parole project showed up at his hearing. We have seen previous situation like him. So he was a lifer, a juvenile lifer. He was locked up when he was 17 years old for, for taking someone's life, someone who he thought stole a medallion of his. And then the Supreme Court ruled in 2016 that it was unconstitutional to give juveniles a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Sorry, that was the Supreme Court ruled in 2012, not 2016. And in 2016, the courts made a retroactive decision to open the door for, for parole possibility. Now, this article that I'm getting this information from was written in 2019. And at that time, they said 8% of juvenile lifers had been granted parole. I'm sure the number is much higher. Now, at the same day, and maybe you've already seen it, I'll put a link. We did cover a hearing of another lifer, but he wasn't a juvenile lifer. But he was a lifer who never took anyone's life. He just had like uh, robbery charges and aggravated battery charges. And he was sent back for life for taking an Amazon package. That's what he did. He took an Amazon package off of his neighbor's porch and they lot they said you're done for life you're done ski this case is much worse this case he's he has a dui which is scary they don't want to have in the news that someone who was locked up for life gets in a car and takes someone's life right that's a disaster from their for everyone's perspective and then he has a weapon he hits a woman he has those charges and forget that they were dropped from the DA. I'm pretty sure the DA knew what was going to happen. You have to assume the DA knew that ugh, we're not going to go to trial. He's getting, he's backing life and he's going to get life. And I, I, I believe that he, so the idea that he would go and, and pick up a weapon after everything he's been through, after serving something like 30 years in prison and getting a second chance. But here's the, the court docket his appeal for when he was initially sentenced, if you want to go through how it even happened. On August 28th, 1985, this goes back that far. At 12.30 p.m., the New Orleans police officer, Norman Taylor, was called to the vicinity uh, to investigate an apparent shooting. Upon his arrival, Officer Taylor discovered Charles um, Shelley lying on the ground, suffering from gunshot wounds to the head and chest. Officer Taylor administered first aid to the victim. He was thereafter transported to the hospital where he passed. An autopsy revealed that, that he had passed from a wound to the head. Toxicology reported evidence of uh, PCP in his blood. Uh, an investigation of the incident revealed the following facts. On the date in question, uh, Charles Shelley Jr., Anthony Williams, and Anthony's brother, Robert Williams, were proceeding on foot towards South Pierce Street as they reached the vicinity of South 
uh, Myra Street, Martin Luther King Boulevard. They were approached by the defendant, Glenn Livis. Livis asked Shelley if he knew who had taken Livis's medallion. And Shelley answered that the person lived in St. Thomas Housing Project. The defendant removed the weapon from his shirt and shot Shelley once in the head. He just pulled it out and shot him. And then as he lay wounded on the ground, he stood over him, fired his gun a second time in his arm and chest. And you think about it, you do this, you get a life sentence, and then you go back, you get a second chance, and you go and you buy another one. In addition for the, and then you hit a woman with it. In addition to the victim's companions who saw the events that night, Miss Oli Moore was playing cards on the porch across the street from shooting with an eyewitness. These persons each positively identified the defendant as the perpetrator of this offense. They had chosen his photograph from a photographic display and presented them. Um, and at trial, uh, testify for the defense, at which time they each alleged that they had been present during the shooting. And, you know, I'll, I'll drop the link. Uh, in the description, you know, they appealed and said that it should have been uh, not second degree, but manslaughter and basically the right back uh, against his appeal. In this case, there was no physical altercation and the defendant was not threatened in any way. The victim and defendant exchanged words and the defendant was described as angry, apparently because someone had stolen his medallion. As such, we find that the actions of the victim on the night in the question were not such that they would have provoked an average person, causing him to be deprived of his self-control or reflection. For these reasons, we conclude that the jury uh, correctly returned a verdict in the second degree. In this case, assignment of error without merit, and I agree. I mean, you, you just pull out a weapon and, and you know, it's, it's just... And he was given a second chance. You know, here's uh, again, thank you, Richard, for sharing this. It was quite a big deal. I don't know why my Instagram is in Spanish, but um, whatever. And here he is getting released from Angola, getting a second chance at life. And they're quite excited about it. And Andrew Humley, I'm reading a statement here, and I'll drop the link to that too. Uh, at, at his at his parole hearing, Andrew Humley, who was also in Angola with him and the executive director of the Louisiana Parole Project, and also who's in prison for taking a, a young girl's life um, when he was young, uh, under the age of 18 as well. So he said, he said, uh, Um, he said that he noted that he went to, 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 that should tell the board that they need to know about, um, um, that he all, okay, sorry. Li uh, Livis also had the support of Andrew Hunley, the executive director of Louisiana Parole Project, which provides services to people recently released from long prison terms. Hunley was the state's first juvenile lifer granted parole. I didn't realize he was the first one granted parole. Hunley said that he had often squared off against Livis in basketball games on Angola grounds. Then here's to quote, you really get to tell a person's true character when you're playing sports, it always a real joy to play against. And wow, Andrew Hunley, uh, that's prophetic right there. Uh, now the board members that granted and parole were Keith Jones, Brandon Kelsey, and Law Loft and Lofton. I don't think we know Lofton. Remember, this took place before. This is, took place before they were airing it on Zoom. So. 
you know, it's interesting again that no one in the parole project came to support him. They didn't give him an attorney. All those things say something. I think it does it mean that the parole project that he just didn't make friends with them. Like they, they did something wrong where they didn't like him. They don't want to support him because we have seen even today at hearings where the parole project came in full force for other people. But then the two lifers that were getting revoked, they, they, they didn't do anything. The one who took the Amazon package, he was still at the parole project and he's still living at the parole project and they didn't put, give him an attorney and what they both needed was an attorney. Uh, but no, there's nothing. And I, I wonder what that is. It is a big deal to get revoked and go back to life. And as far as I knew, the Pro Project only had one life for get revoked. Uh, and we did that hearing and he had two DUIs and he had threatened the family that gave him a truck and was boarding him. Uh, it, it was, but they came in with an attorney and three people from the Pro Project to talk on his behalf. And in this case, it was as if they didn't even exist. But you might not believe it if you didn't see it. And man, like like Mr. Freeman said, I just don't get it, man. I just don't get it. And you just can't get it. It's it's everything on the line. And you make the decisions to go and buy a weapon. You make the decisions to go and and hurt a woman in public. You know, in front of like you're facing life. If you don't have enough self control to protect yourself, then you're you got to be a danger to society. Now he probably will have another opportunity at parole. Maybe it's in five years from now or something. But you know. anyways, uh, if you like revocation hearings, I have a playlist. You can go check it out over here for other hearings. And with that, I'll let you go.